Our next reading is from Mark chapter 10. This morning, Mark chapter 10, we'll begin reading in verse 32. Mark 10, verse 32, to the end of the chapter. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are, go- we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you to drink the cup? that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you shall drink, and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John, Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many." Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, take courage, stand up, he is calling for you. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. We come this morning to the end of one of the larger sections in the book of Mark. Um, For immediate context, we are one week before the cross and only a single day's walk from Jerusalem is where we find Jesus and the twelve, along with Bartimaeus, here in Jericho. This is the last miracle that Mark records for us. And Mark chapter 10, it's it's taken us a while to trudge through it, but it's been full of these interactions that help us to see more of who our Lord is. In the very beginning, the Pharisees were testing Jesus, trying to trap Him and outsmart Him. Later, we consider the rich young ruler who wanted eternal life with minimal cost. And last week, the disciples James and John requesting powerful places in Christ's coming kingdom. It's a bit of a relief to get to Bartimaeus at the end of the chapter. He just wants to see. Right? He's not trying to trip Jesus up. He's not trying to outsmart him. He's not trying to get into heaven with minimal cost. He's not asking to sit on the right or the left. As he says it, I want to regain my sight. And as we will note here as we walk through the text in just a moment, Christ hears the calls of his people. 
Christ overcomes every barrier to his people's salvation and needs, and Christ saves. So while I've titled it Believing Bartimaeus this morning, we could have also titled it Overcoming Obstacles, because there is no obstacle, not in Bartimaeus' life and not in your life or my life, that Christ cannot overcome in order to accomplish his purposes. And in the midst of the introduction last week, I got a little sidetracked and unveiled some of the ideas that I had with regard to this passage and us calling him blind Bartimaeus. I think the fact that we so readily call him blind Bartimaeus exposes the identity issues that we often face, particularly as Christians. In fact, one of the books that I read, one of the commentaries that I considered this week, titled the chapter on dealing with this section of verses 46 to 52 that we're looking at together this morning, the title of it was Blind Man Sees. That's a contradiction. You know what? Blind people don't see. Once you see, you're not blind anymore. But we see this reality we understand what, it, what is being insinuated and what is meant by it, but I think it's helpful for us to state the truth. He's not blind Bartimaeus. He's believing Bartimaeus. We see this elsewhere in Scripture, Psalm 113, Psalm 113 verse 9. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. The psalmist gets it. She was a barren mother, a, a barren woman, pardon, and now she's a joyful mother. You can't be both. But we are prone to, particularly in our immediate context, culture, and society, we are prone to add these adjectives to nouns or adjecti adjectival modifiers which create new nouns. And allegiance ends up being given to the defining terms, to the adjectives, right? Bartimaeus is not what, is, is not his identity, right? The blindness has become his identity. When we say blind Bartimaeus, you're not thinking the son of Timaeus, which the text even tells us that that's who he is, but you're thinking he's blind. That's his problem. That's his issue. That's who he is. But we've done this with the term Christian. We've put adjectives in front of Christian. Not in every area, but that's the direction that we're headed if we aren't careful. We have a, con a context out there in modern evangelicalism for the gay Christian, which is a contradiction of terms like blind man sees, or barren mother. It's a contradiction of terms. It would be like saying that you're an alcoholic Christian or a racist Christian. Does anybody want to raise their hand and agree to that? It's as absurd as an unbelieving Christian or an atheist Christian or a Muslim Christian or a lost Christian or a Mormon Christian. We could go on and on. We use these terms to define Christian rather than allowing the term Christian as a noun to be our identifying mark. It is who we are. We identify with Christ. There doesn't need to be an adjective. The sinful identity ends up taking precedent over the identity with Christ. Not only that, it provides and promotes a very pessimistic outlook on the Christian life because we end up identifying ourselves or others by the sin that they claim to have been saved from. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. When we come to Christ, we abandon all adjectives before Christian. We abandon them all with the lifestyle, like abandoning the old sin that Paul makes clear here in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We abandon the old sin when we become Christians. We battle with it, but we've abandoned it. The term Christian, when biblically applied, just the term Christian, 
describes the position that we have before God, our identity in Him, as well as our experience of life. The apostle, again, makes this clear in Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You hear the position that is ours as Christians, crucified with Christ. That's our position before God. What about our identity? It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What about the experience of life? The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. That is the experience of the Christian. When we think about labels, they aren't always helpful, but they can be crucial. Because there is a clear association and a clear identification that comes with labels. Back to blind Bartimaeus. He's not blind. It's an inaccurate label. Now, I should point out, given the other things that I'm mentioning, that blindness is not sin. However, in the days of Bartimaeus, it was considered to be sin. We know that from John chapter 9. Jesus passed by. He saw a man blind from birth. Do you remember what his disciples asked? Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither this man that sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So while blindness isn't a sin, it was considered that way in Bartimaeus' day in his Nickname, if you will, Blind Bartimaeus has stuck down through the ages. I mean, when we say Blind Bartimaeus, we know exactly who we're talking about. He was only blind for a brief time. He's been seeing for a long time now. So we'll call him Believing Bartimaeus. As we consider the text, I will probably now inadvertently call him Blind Bartimaeus all day long. Nonetheless, believing Bartimaeus, let's consider verses 46 and 47 together as point number one, begging blind. 48 to 50, Christ's calling, and 51 and 52, saved and seeing. Begging blind, Christ's calling, saved and seeing. Then they, that is Jesus and his disciples and a crowd, came to Jericho. As he was going out of Jericho, there was a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sitting by the road. So Mark, as you may remember from the beginning, is writing to a primarily Gentile audience, which is why he uses the redundancy here. Bartimaeus is literally the son of Timaeus. You remember Simon Bar-Jonah, the son of Jonah? I mean, Bar is literally the son of. So Bartimaeus is the son of Timaeus. He's explaining that to the Gentile audience. Yeah, people like us. He's sitting by the road. Someone who was, was blind had no choice but to beg in that society. Right? There, there's no government sustenance. There, there's no help from anyone. They have to sit on the side of the road and beg in order to have money to buy food to live, completely unable to work. The computer hadn't quite been invented. They, they, they didn't have desk jobs. Their only choice, only chance at survival was the charity of others. They were completely dependent on others for guidance, for protection, for sustenance. It's remarkable, the transition from where Jesus and his disciples have just left. James and John want to sit on thrones. Bartimaeus is sitting in the roadside dust. He is making no demand for glory or power, but he is calling out to Christ from his desolate poverty. James and John are entitled in their requests. When you come into your glory, Let us sit on your right and on your left. But Bartimaeus' posture, complete dependence, 
as he longs for and dreams about mercy being shown to him. When Bartimaeus, verse 47, heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, there is a strong chance, it's very likely that this is the first time in Bartimaeus' history that he's asked for something other than money to provide. I mean, this is his primary source of income. He would have almost exclusively asked for money. But this day, on this day, when he hears the crowd approaching, when he smells the dust being stirred up, he doesn't ask for money to buy bread. He begs for mercy from the Messiah. Jesus, son of David, a blatant messianic title for Jesus. Just think back with me. James and John completely misunderstand the messianic mission of Jesus, asking to sit on his right and on his left when he gets to Jerusalem, not realizing that those places, as we saw last week, were reserved for thieves who would be crucified beside him. But here's Bartimaeus, who's been listening and learning and understands, very likely I would say he's already believing at this point, he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He believed that not only was Jesus David's son, but that he was David's Lord, as the psalmist tells us. But look at the response. Verse 48, many were sternly telling him to be quiet. Sternly telling him. He's a nuisance to the crowd. Like the crowd is enjoying the pomp and circumstance as they make their way to the Passover. Lots of Jews are headed through Jericho to Jerusalem for the Passover. And this blind man on the roadside is a nuisance, crying out to Jesus for mercy. This blind man is interrupting their plans, their prerogatives, asking for something. They assume that Jesus will want nothing to do with him since they themselves want nothing to do with him. The disciples had done this before. They are most likely the culprits again. Mark is kind here and says it's someone in the crowd. But look back at verse 13 of chapter 10. They were bringing children to Jesus so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. The disciples rebuked parents from bringing their children to Jesus. And now the crowd that the disciples are in are sternly telling this man who has nothing, he is desolate, telling him to be quiet. Mark dignifies Bartimaeus here more than any other recipient in any of the Gospels of a healing or a miracle. No one else even gets a name. We usually know something about them. Sometimes we're introduced to a family member's by name. But Mark gives us his name here. One of the reasons that Mark likely gives Bartimaeus his name, we'll see at the end that he followed Jesus. Some history shows that he was actually played a part in the leadership of, a, of the church in the early days. And a lot of the people reading Mark's original account of the gospel would have known exactly who he was talking about. Oh, that Bartimaeus. That's how he came to faith. And so Mark calls him by name. Well, most recipients of healings were not named at all. They were sternly telling this man to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He just kept crying out. Why? Because he was dependent. He recognized his need. He also recognized that Christ and Christ alone could help him. He didn't, the, the people that were telling him to be quiet, he didn't say, you give me what I need and I'll be quiet. He had no hope in them. His hope was exactly in the right place. His hope was only in Christ. 
And he was persistent in his calling for Christ. He was determined to receive mercy from Christ. And he refused to be dissuaded from pursuing Christ. It was praiseworthy persistence. He knew that Christ could heal him. He was convinced that Christ had the compassion for people like him and the power that was required to give him sight. He had heard the stories. He knew that he had done it before. And he had every reason to believe that Christ would prove himself sufficient and faithful even in his own life. And look at verse 49. And Jesus stopped. A large crowd. The Passover processional. Christ's determination. We saw it last week to go to Jerusalem. He, he's so determined to go there, he's leading the disciples. The crowd is surging. They're picking up more and more people along the way, the closer to Jerusalem that they get. The cross is looming in the near future. In his mind, on his heart, the pain, the suffering, the shame, the unimaginable burden that was weighing on him. And Mark said, and Jesus stopped. He has not lost his pity for others. His compassion and care for others is not depleted in any way. In light of the large processional or his own determination or the size of the surging crowd or the looming pain and suffering and shame of the cross, nothing would stand in the way of Christ hearing the call of Bartimaeus, answering him, saving him, healing him. This Christ is the same one that Hebrews 13, 8 tells us, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This Christ hears the cries of his people today. And nothing stands in the way. He hears every cry of every one of his children in distress. He hears the calls of those who need him. And there is no one too insignificant for Jesus. Unquestionably, Bartimaeus was the most insignificant person in the immediate area. The majority were by far on their way to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. He's sitting on the side of a dirty road asking for money, for bread. Until this day, when the Jesus that he's heard about comes walking by and he cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped because he heard him. He overcame every obstacle. He overcame his blindness. He overcame his need to beg. He overcame the noise of the crowd. He overcame the lack of concern of the crowd. He overcame the crowd telling the man to be quiet. It's worth noting the crowd here. If we're going to find ourselves in this story, it's probably in the crowd. We want to be careful not to be in this crowd. Look at what they said. The first thing they say, the crowd, be quiet, verse 48. And then when Jesus said, call him here. Look, so they, the crowd, called the blind man saying, take courage, stand up, he's calling you. Which way, crowd? Be quiet. No, come on, Jesus is calling you. Take courage. The crowd doesn't know if they're coming or going. Moment by moment, it's as if they're seeing which way the wind is blowing or the stream is flowing. They lack any conviction except for the current thing. We want to avoid being in this crowd. 
making wrong assumptions about where people are and where Jesus is working and what we ought to be doing, Jesus stopped in the midst of all the busyness, all of the the weight that was on him. A week before the cross, he stopped and said, call him here. And they called him and said, take courage, stand up. He's calling you three times here in this verse. Call, call, call. Christ is calling you in the same way that he was calling Bartimaeus. Jesus is attentive to the prayers of his people. Look ahead with me to chapter 11, verse 9, a very familiar verse. You remember when Jesus arrived at Jerusalem, those who went in front and those who followed were shouting upon his arrival, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus didn't stop. He is far more attentive to the prayers of his people than he is to the shallow hallelujahs of the crowd. He heard Bartimaeus and he stopped. I mentioned avoiding finding ourselves in the crowd Let's think for a moment about our response. What is our response like to those who need Jesus? Do we shush them the way Bartimaeus is being shushed by the crowd? Do we just ignore them, just pretend they're not there? Do we assume Christ does not hear them or that he doesn't want to hear them? Are they a nuisance? That's what the disciples and the crowd assumed here. Let's be careful that we don't find ourselves in the crowd. Jesus stopped and said, call him here. Call Bartimaeus to me. So the crowd called to Bartimaeus and said, take courage, stand up. He is calling for you. He's calling you. This wasn't the only time that Jesus called for someone when the story of Mary and Martha after their brother had died, when Martha went away and called Mary, her sister, and said, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Mary's distraught, grieving, and Jesus was calling for her. When she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Mary responded in the same way that Bartimaeus responded, in the same way that we ought to respond when we hear Christ calling, we ought to get up quickly and come to him. He didn't need all the encouragement from the crowd. Take courage, they said. Stand up. All he needed to know was that Christ had heard him. Look at verse 50. Throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Listen, the cloak's all he had. This is a blind man who's begging for his every meal. In fact, if you've been to a really poor country, you will see blind and other disabled people who are forced to beg. A cloak is what they have spread out on the ground in front of them. And so everything that they're accumulating, the coins and such, are being flipped onto this to keep it off the ground. What's comparable in our country, it's like an open guitar case, right? The homeless is playing the guitar. or I think around here they actually have a speaker inside the case that's playing and they're just pretending to play the guitar as they collect money. All he had... Everything that he had accumulated in order to eat that day, throws it aside. It's nothing in comparison to Christ hearing him. He throws aside his cloak. He jumps up and he came to Jesus. I mean, imagine this. He jumped. He's never done anything in a hurry. Blind people couldn't. It was too dangerous. Someone had to be there guiding him, helping him every step of the way, protecting him for the entirety of his life, and here he cries out to Jesus, have mercy on him. Then he's notified. He's calling for you, and he jumps up, and he comes to Jesus. I wonder if we're willing to put aside anything and everything that is hindering us. Just pitch it aside and come to Jesus as we are. I mean, really, nothing would have been wrong with him gathering his 
little belongings there in his cloak and throwing it over his back and coming to Jesus, we wouldn't have faulted him one bit. At the same time, it sure is encouraging to see him just throw everything aside and come and fling himself onto the mercy of the Lord. Answering him. So answering, have mercy on me. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You remember that question from before. I pointed it out last week. That's exactly the question that Jesus asked James and John. Verse 36. Immediately after them saying, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Here's Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Bartimaeus? And the blind man said, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. So he called him teacher in one sense, but it's included in this term is you are the Lord and the master. I mean, he, he's giving him honor and reverence, recognizing who he is. What can we say about Bartimaeus at this point? He may have been blind in sight, but he was not blind in soul. He could see who Christ was. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, Peter mentions it this way, though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is where Bartimaeus was. Sightless sockets, but a saved soul. He knew who Christ was. And we see this based on Jesus' response in verse 52. Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Literally, your faith has saved you. And then the next sentence, immediately he regained his sight and began following him on the road. The darkness, all that Bartimaeus had known in days gone by, became light in an instant. All the danger that he had known due to his blindness became safety because now he could see. All the dependence that he had on his everything became sustenance in an instant. In the short span of Christ's words to him, the blindness was remedied and he saw his Savior. At that brief interval, pity and power converge on Bartimaeus. Christ's heart goes out to him in compassion and pity, and he applies his power to him, bringing healing to his eyes. And Bartimaeus receiving his sight, like so many of the miracles we see recorded in the Gospels, serve as a picture for us, a picture of us receiving spiritual sight. It's a picture of conversion, of God having pity for us and sending His own Son to live and to die, and for Him accomplishing His power in us, applying all of the benefits that Christ purchased for us by His Spirit. It's a picture of our healing, of the healing of spiritual blindness. John Newton understood it in his famous and familiar hymn, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was lost, now found. Was blind, now see. It's a perfect parallel. It's a wonderful picture. Being blind and then seeing. Being dead to our sin and being alive to God. It's a, it's a portrait of conversion of turning to God in repentance and in faith. It's embracing Jesus Christ as He is freely offered in the gospel. And this embrace may be a dramatic embrace 
for some based on their life before Christ. It may not be dramatic. It may be a very emotional embrace for some. It may not be very emotional for others. It may be a quiet embrace. It may not be a quiet embrace, but it will be an embracing of Christ. Not in a single moment, but a continuing relationship of trusting Him and hoping in Him and depending on Him and walking with Him. Bartimaeus receiving his sight is a picture of conversion. Spiritual conversion, spiritual sight is us turning in a new direction. Think about the difference between being blind and seeing. I mean, close your eyes for a moment and open them. There's a little bit of difference. That's what conversion to Christ is like. From sin in repentance to God in faith. It's, there, it's a conscious, deliberate turning away from sin to God. Conversion includes the illumination of our minds. Not only do we see God for who He is, but we see sin for what it is. Conversion includes, as a result of seeing sin for what it is, it includes genuine sorrow for sin. Not simply remorse due to the consequences of sin. Conversion includes confession of sin, confession to God, agreeing with Him about our sin, and confession to those who are affected and harmed by the sin. Conversion includes a hatred of sin, and included with that hatred of sin is a deliberate resolve to be rid of that sin. Conversion to Christ includes a returning to God as our gracious Father, believing and trusting that He can and that He will forgive our sins. Conversion to Christ includes a wholehearted joy in God through Christ for the free offer of forgiveness. And conversion brings with it a genuine love for God and for others, not perfect, but genuine along with an ongoing delight to know and do the will of God. In summation, conversion brings about change. From being blind to seeing is change, remarkable change. Conversion brings about remarkable change with regard to God, with regard to one another, in the church, and with regard to the world. It results in reverence for God, seeking to worship Him in all things as our all in all. It brings about a change in our relationship with God's people. We seek to promote unity within the body of Christ, and it changes our our responsibility to the world. We see and recognize that apart from Jesus Christ, the world is lost and dying. And so we go to them. When we've been converted, we go and we tell them of the good news that Christ has come to save sinners. So we have reverence for God in worshiping Him. Our relationship is altered with one another within the church as we pursue unity together the unity of the faith, and our responsibility to the world that God has created is to evangelize them and tell them of the hope that there is in Christ. I mentioned at the outset that one potential title, definitely a theme throughout this text, is of Christ overcoming obstacles. Now think with me for a moment in closing. What obstacles are preventing you from coming to Christ? What obstacles are preventing you from walking more closely with Christ? What obstacles are keeping you from pursuing unity with brothers and sisters in Christ? 
What obstacles are keeping you from going to a lost world and telling them about Christ? Christ can, and Christ has, and Christ will overcome them all if you will trust Him. When we fail to trust Him, we are letting sin define us. We're looking for some adjective to put in front of Christian, whether it's reserved or shy or quiet or confident or busy. There's a thousand things that stand in the way of us coming to Christ, of us walking more closely with Christ, of us sharing with others about Christ. Don't let sin define you, not past sin, not present sin. Be defined by Christ alone. Be identified with Christ primarily. Be associated most closely with Christ, this Christ, the one who hears over all of the clamor and clatter of the world, the one who overcomes every obstacle imaginable, and the one who saves every single person who comes to him by faith. Come to this Christ and be defined and identified and associated with him and with his people for his glory and for your good. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the compassion that you have for sinners as we see it displayed in the life of Bartimaeus. God, we thank you for your power to save. We thank you that you've evidenced that power in so many of us. God, we pray that you would continue proving that your ear is not dull, that you still hear, and that your arm is not short and you still save. God, will you rescue souls. God, for those who are allowing obstacles in the way of walking close with you, will you overcome them? Will you prove that you're still an idol-smashing God, worthy of love and devotion? God, we pray that you will help us as your people to pursue knowing you, and doing your will, coming to you daily, weekly together as your people, seeking to accomplish your purposes, and desiring to see the lost, both near and far, come to the saving knowledge that is found in Christ Jesus, your Son and our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen.